Hi everyone, welcome back. Modular Workspaces 1.7 is now available. So this is compatible with Blender 4.0 and above. This is quite an important update because Blender 4.0 actually broke previous versions of Modular Workspaces. So it took some time figuring out what went wrong and trying to build new systems to compensate. What I'm going to do in this video is tell you about the new limitations that have been imposed on the add-on due to the breaking changes in Blender 4.0. But I'll also tell you about the small extra features we've added as well to try and compensate for that. If you've already got the add-on or if you're already familiar, this video may still be important to you because you will learn about what's changed and may also pick up some extra tips on how to use it. But if you're brand new here for a quick rundown, Modular Workspaces is my add-on for helping you speed up your startup workflow in Blender. Now what I mean by that is if you use Blender frequently, you tend to do the same things over and over again when starting a file that lean into the type of project you're making. So you may start with a default cube, delete it, place some lights around, modify your world nodes a bit, and maybe spend like 10 minutes just getting it into a semi-usable state before you actually start doing your proper work. Modular Workspaces exists is basically to cut out that part of the project. So what I'm going to do is give you a quick demonstration and then we'll explain how it works. So I'm in Blender and I've got absolutely nothing in the scene. Using modular workspaces, I'm going to flick a pie menu down to open the asset browser. I'm going to pull out a collection asset, press unpack and then enter the camera. And then in the rendered view, we are ready to go. You'll notice that there are already lights in the scene and they are organized into their own collections. There are objects and they've been organized into an objects collection and there's a camera likewise organized into its own collection. So we didn't have to place anything manually and everything is just ready with a nice setup for us to access. Now what happened there is you can mark collections as assets in Blender and this means they will appear in the asset browser. The thing is when you import collection assets into other Blend files, when you drag them in, for example I'll drag in the view tunnel, they're just one object rather than every object that makes up that collection. So what you typically have to do is press Control A and then make instances real and it will bring all the objects in. But the thing is even that's kind of messy. Depending on the parameters you chose when making instances real down here in the bottom, the objects may look different, they'll be organized differently, they'll also have this trailing dot zero zero one at the bottom of the name, it won't even be centered on the world origin, and they won't be organized into collections. It's basically giving you more work to do to try and organize it after the fact. However, you'll see that if I bring the view tunnel back in and then press unpack, everything is organized, the names have been cleaned up except for this one, but that's a mistake I made. But then you are pretty much ready to go. What I'm going to do now is just quickly add a three point light setup and then place a uh, Suzanne object in the scene. And now with this view tunnel, object, which in this case makes it look like we're looking through a medium in the scene, which here is an underwater effect, we can just get on with our work. Now Modular Workspaces has a panel here on the right to customize all this behavior. So we can choose different ways that the objects are unpacked. But one of the things which people find most useful with this add-on are the toggle buttons and pie menu. So notice in the demonstration earlier when I opened a pie menu and flicked down to open the asset browser. Here on the right, you can customize what button you want to press to open that pie menu. Now by default, I believe it's on Alt and space. So you'd have alt ticked here and then you choose the space bar. But what I like to place it on is the mouse button four. So for me, this is the back button, which means that without even touching the keyboard, if I'm in the 3D view, I can just hold my thumb down and then move to open one of the areas or close them. The areas that you open here are also directly correlated to the buttons that appear at the top. So if you prefer to click on a button to open and close a section of the editor, then you can do that and they are customizable here. So you see we have the left, top, right and bottom areas, which are corresponding to the top. So for example, if I choose the bottom area, we can see that the asset browser button there correlates to the asset browser editor we've selected. And this also appears at the bottom of the pie menu. I can also choose the percentage size it opens or I can name it something else like something stupid, for example, and now the button is named stupid and on the pie menu, we can open stupid. But if there's no name there, it will reset to the default name. But if you like, you can choose icon only mode and it will only display the icon for the editor if you want to make things more compact. Now the asset browser in particular is quite important. So if I open the asset browser settings here, you can see that we can set a default asset library. Now you would put the name in here, which means that when I open the asset browser, it's automatically going to choose my favorite library. So this is one where I've entered the name here. Now this is useful because if you wanted to open the asset browser manually, you'd have to, you know, drag up part of the interface, click and then try and find the asset browser, which it doesn't matter how many years you've been using Blender. I know for a fact that most people, when they click and open menus like this, even with the old modifier menu, even if you know where the asset browser browser is, you're still going to spend a few extra seconds looking for it. There's just some weird psychological quirk. And even when you've opened the asset browser, it might not be on your favorite library. So you need to go click and then find it. And then even then the thumbnail size might not be what you like. So you've got to open this and then scale it down again. So there's this whole process. I didn't like that. So what you have selected in the asset browser settings here, when you open it, it will just automatically set that for you. So that saves extra time as well. It's also important to keep in mind the different parameters here, because when you press unpack setup, it's going to unpack every collection.
collection asset it can find in the scene. What this means is if you drag in multiple collection assets, almost like choosing your favorite ingredients for a meal, you drag them all in and then press unpack, it will align them all, unpack them and organize them for you. But sometimes you just want to bring in a collection without modifying other collection assets in the scene. In that case, you would just press selected only. Also, you can choose to keep the parent and hierarchy. Now, this is particularly important, especially for the view tunnel here, because this is technically a rig and I did something a little bit sneaky. I didn't show you that the way we imported it is actually the wrong way. It's broken because the camera is not connected to the object. So let's do that again. Because I know I'm importing a collection asset where the parent hierarchy needs to be preserved, I'm going to tick keep parent and keep hierarchy. Then I'm going to drag the view tunnel in and I'm also going to drag in the three point lighting. So we see both those collection assets here. I'm going to press unpack setup. And now things are a bit different because if I move the camera around, the view tunnel object moves with it. So now if I go into it, I can move the camera around and it looks like I'm looking around underwater. But of course, because I'm using area lights, we can see the area light uh, through the medium. So this tool is compatible with any asset library, but it does also come with my own custom asset library with custom icons as well. Also, I've designed the icons in a way where they're kind of color coded depending on what they are. So collection assets mostly have this blue accent to them. Lighting has the light bulb icons and tend to bias towards green colors. The world nodes are more purple. These are things which you can drag straight into your world nodes. Cameras tend to be more orange. So you can see with the view tunnel would go an orange circle there representing the camera looking through the medium. And then also I have character displays. So these are things where if you had like a character model and you wanted a good lighting setup to display them in, then you can just drag one in. Let me do the Murtos one, unpack it. And then if I bring Suzanne in, you'll have a lighting setup you can use. And it's a highly customizable one as well. There's a previous video talking about it where you can enable and disable different lighting sources and also use volume effects in the world nodes to customize how it looks. So there's a lot to play with. But now let's talk about things which have changed. So 1.7 specific changes compensating for some of the issues which arose with Blender 4.0. So in previous versions, we could basically flick open windows in any direction we wanted without a care in the world. But because of a new issue brought in with the Python changes, the biggest limitation is now you can only open windows in one particular direction. So like horizontally or vertically. So you'll notice that I've opened a shader editor on the left and a geometry nodes editor on the right here. And if I go to open the Pi menu, you'll see that up and down are unavailable, but you can still close the geometry and the shader editor uh, on the side and then go to open the vertical ones. So this will be the most annoying limitation. It's to do with the fact that for some reason we can't close multiple windows at once now at the same time in the code as this will crash Blender or generate errors. Now there may be some Python developers out there which can go, wait, I can do that in the code, but modular workspaces is a little bit complicated because we're also trying to consider windows which are open in other layouts as well. So you see that in the second layout, I've opened the geometry nodes window on the right. But if I go back to the 3D view, for some reason, I can no longer open vertical windows because there's still something open in the other layout. Now, this version of the add-on is actually backwards compatible with Blender 3.6 or 6, the last version, and it does behave a bit differently there. So I've come over to Blender 3.6.1 and I've just set the Pi menu to my mouse button again. So here, if I open a side one, I can also open the top one and the left and the bottom and keep going as I like. And I can go to another workspace and keep doing the same. So you'll notice that even though the code is the same, there's an extra limitation in the 4.0 version just because of Python issues which were introduced in Blender 4.0. But we've given you a way out of the issue. So for example, if you open the asset browser and you think, oh, I really want to open the shader editor on the left, but I don't want to have to go and do it myself, you'll see this button called forget areas. Now what this does is it forces modular workspace to forget about something it's already opened, whether it's in this workspace or a different workspace like over here or a different scene entirely. So if you're really annoyed by the fact that you can't open a certain side, just press forget areas and then go ahead and continue opening. So you have the power to basically overwrite this limitation. What it means is you won't be able to then toggle the asset browser back off. So that's just an important thing to keep in mind. So the forget areas button can be found in the Pi menu and again in the top right here with the big red button. So again, just to clarify, 1.7 can be used in 3.6 versions and in 4.0, but it will behave differently in each version. So it's kind of clever in a way because it's compensating for an issue and trying to prevent a crash from happening. It's taken a while to get this version up and running because of those issues, but we have to give massive thanks to Gixo, who basically did all of the legwork Work for this version while I was working on the Blender 4.0 release video and afterwards as well. So you can see the issue that I have to face as an add-on developer. Sometimes you have to make difficult decisions. It's do we have to skip a version of Blender, a really important version of Blender, because the add-on is definitely going to crash people's projects? Or do we limit the feature set to force crashes not to happen, hopefully temporarily, so that when the Python issues are fixed in a future version, we can bring those limited features back again. Okay, so now that's out of the way, let me just quickly mention this new collection asset. So 
So my startup file is also included in the product files on Gumroad and Blender Market. And in my startup file, this diorama is basically what I start with, what I look at when I open a new file. So let me just go back and reset this. So this has been like the default collection asset, if you want to think about it this way. The first thing I always drag into my file. However, recently on Twitter, another product creator called Smouse was testing some really interesting lighting techniques using light nodes to modify the influence of point lights to create some gradient lighting effects. And I like this so much that I created a new version of this diorama called Diorama Color. So that is what this is. So again, it's effectively the same diorama setup, but now you have this beautiful color lighting, which you can very easily modify in the shader nodes as well. And then you'll see it says inspired by Smouse. So I feel like this is something that people will really like. Maybe you might even want to set this as your startup file. Also, previously, where you would download the files for this add-on, you would be able to download a zip file for the included asset library and also a blend file version. You would use the zip file, for example, if you wanted to go to edit preferences, file paths, and then extract the folder in the zip file to contain all of the categories in the asset library, as well as all the content. So basically everything is pre-organized for you and you would link the extracted folder here to tell Blender where the asset library is. Just downloading the blend file is different from this because it's not a folder that preserves all the categories. The blend file is just something you would throw into a different asset library and then all of the content would appear in the unassigned section. This may be a bit complicated for people that have never used an asset library before or the asset browser system in Blender, but just to simplify things now, the only way to get the included asset library is by downloading the zip file, which you then extract onto your computer and then link this up in your file paths. So we will then appear with all the categories intact. And now for the very important installation advice. If you have a previous version of Modular Workspaces installed, please remove this from your system before installing 1.7. So what I mean is, first of all, you can go into your add-ons, then look for Modular Workspaces and then remove it. But after you remove it from Blender, make sure you restart Blender. So we know that the classes have been unregistered and the properties have been deleted properly. So then when you next open Blender, then you can install the new version. Also, like I said, we've imposed limitations to prevent crashes from occurring. However, I can't can't guarantee that crashes won't happen. And they may be due to modular workspaces and they may be due to Blender. It's hard to know for sure. But if you think that a crash is caused by modular workspaces and you have cleanly installed the add-on as I've just showed you, a last resort thing to try may be to factory reset your version of Blender. Now, the reason I say this is because some information is stored in the user preferences file in your app data relating to add-ons. It might be the case that some leftover information is interfering with the new version of the add-on. However, if you have tried all of these things and you are still encountering crashes. If you are able to replicate those crashes, then please let me know by going to my contact page on my website, because then you'll be helping to inform us on what is causing the issues. And also before I close this up, I would like to say that if you use modular workspaces, and I know a good number of you do, I would love to hear about the different ways it's been improving your workflow. Now there are lots of different things in the asset library here, which I could talk endlessly about, but I think it would also be fun just to let you explore them for yourself. But of course you can watch the previous videos on the add-on, but please keep in mind that the interface layouts may look different and the specific details about the asset library content may also be different. But like I said, you can use this tool with any of your own asset libraries. So please feel free to adapt the tool for your own workflow. This video will now go on to replace the video that is placed on the store pages for the add-on. And again, hopefully as new versions of Blender come along, we will relieve some of the limitations imposed to prevent crashes. There's lots of stuff I would like to add to this add-on in the future, and I can't guarantee that the price won't rise. In fact, there's a pretty good chance that the price of the add-on package will rise in the future. So better to pick it up now than later, but I will say at the very specific time of this recording, Black Friday is about to come up, so keep an eye out. If you made it this far through the video, please put some kind of light bulb emoji in the comments so I can see who you are. And again, thank you for watching this all the way through. I really appreciate your support. If you're new here, you can also subscribe for more content relating to Blender. I make all different kinds of tools, and if you want to help support this channel, you can support me on Patreon. And if you support on the $5 tier or above for over a year, you'll be entitled to access to a private server with unreleased content and exclusive files. If you want to sponsor a video, head on over to codasol.online slash services and fill out the form. And follow me on social media so you can stay updated on everything going on. Have a fantastic day, everyone. Please enjoy the tool and I will see you next time.